Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. We have uh, Goldsmiths, come on up, um, from the UK. And they are going to be showing and talking to you about the wired eye. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi everyone. I'm Sam. I'm from New York, and my background's in sociology. And I'm Anu, and I am from India, and I have a background in new media and electronics. So we started our project off by thinking about the different ways in which we give away our personal data to companies and services, most of which are online. So whether it's through Netflix, Twitter, Spotify, um, our main question we were dealing with was, where is our data? So where is the data that we're giving away? Where is it going? And then eventually, where is it stored? So we were interested in both, if we could have access to this information, can we find out where it's going? And we also wanted to keep in mind that it's not just an individual issue, but it's also one at a governmental level as well. So what are the privacy policies of different countries that are affecting how our data is handled? Um, so <clears throat> we wanted to approach our project by using design as a way to engage and provoke people into these issues. And we looked into similar projects within this domain that serve as examples of design which have looked into these issues before. So, uh, so on the left, you can see this project by James Bridal, who is a writer and an artist. And this project is, a, is, is about how he distorted Google map images to comment on how we use maps in a very straightforward way. And uh, to the right, you can see Thomas Twaits' Nebo project, which is this all-knowing god-like device, which dictates, how, dictates what is being recommended to us because it knows what is good for us. Yep. So, yeah. And these are just some highlights from our research. Um, we spoke to students at our university, asking them how they feel about companies and organizations having access to their data. Um, and a lot of people expressed both skepticism and frustration around this lack of clarity and lack of consent in how their data is being stored, if it's being stored, and where, and how. Um, and in general, there was just an emphasis on a desire for more transparency in the process. Um, we also made different probes. This is an example in the middle of an image probe we made to try to get at this issue of the public versus private divide. Um, what sorts of areas do we want to leave off limits? What do we still feel is private? And we just want to get reactions from people on that. Um, and then we also conducted several interviews. And one that really stuck with us was with a designer named Thomas Thwaites. And we spoke with him a lot about the important role that both faith and superstition play in our relationship to our data and how those things affect both our behavior and our beliefs around that. Yeah. <clears throat> so taking off from what we interviewed with Thomas Twaits, uh, so what came up strongly was the, fact that, was the fact that humans are naturally ir irrational. And then we have very strong beliefs and superstitions about systems that we don't entirely understand. And sometimes we lend these ideas to objects such as art, like, like objects such as the Nazars that you can see in the image to the left, which are what, which are devices which people use to ward off, ward off evil. And we were thinking, how what would it be like if you could actually use these charms to protect your data? And then going back to this theme of transparency that emerged, um, as an exercise, we looked at an IP trace route of where our data is going when we request a certain website. So in this example, um, we tried to we requested Facebook.com from our servers at Goldsmiths, and then we were able to map the different um, IP addresses. We linked them through Google Maps, and we're able to have that visual of where our data was really going. Right. So at this point, we became more interested in where our data is stored and less in the journey that it was taking. So we started investing our time in trying to physicalize this whole idea of how do you know where your data is and how can we make these places more visible. And so we, where we wound up was with the wired eye, which is this object here um, that lets you that shows you aerial images of data centers where your data is going, and it shows them to you through a kaleidoscopic lens. And we felt that this was really important um, for two different reasons, one being that the, the distorted imagery creates these really beautiful, intriguing visuals that make you want to look and make you want to find out what these are images of. Um, and secondly, the distortion was also a way to comment on the blurry nature of ever really knowing where your data is going. Um, so it's posing the question, can you ever really know? 
Right. So let me unpack this a little for you. So what it essentially, do, essentially does is that it takes your individual browsing history from your personal device and puts it into an IP geolocation service, which gets your geo geographical coordinates of that particular IP address, and then gets the satellite imagery for it, and then which is beamed into the LCD screen of the wired eye, and what you see is this beautiful image of your data center. And these are just some images from the process of making the final prototype. Um, on the left, these are just some technical drawings, but you can see that it was really important for us to incorporate the visual language of these charms like the Nazars that are used to ward off evil, um, and also to create this optical illusion when looking at the device from the top. Um, and then this is just an image of the CNC router we used to make the object and the pieces of acrylic that fit together to make it. Right. So uh, we also created an accompanying publication um, and we selected 20 different data centers um, to show the spread of where your data might be around the world. Yeah, and to find these 20 data centers, these are just the steps we took. Um, with a particular website, you can then find the IP address using a terminal on your computer. And then with that IP address, you can put it into a geolocation service, of which there are many online websites. Um, and then through the geographical coordinates that you get from there, you can use a service like Google Maps to locate the aerial image. Right, so this is a sample view through the uh, publication. Um, it clearly shows you an, a sample view through the wired eye and the data center, the, the geographical location of it, its address, along with the IP address of the service that you're using to make that relationship completely clear. And this is just a sample view that you may see through the wired eye. Um, in this example, it's the Equinix data center in Dubai, and it's actually one of the data centers that Amazon uses. So this is a prototype demo of how it feels to use the wired eye, the experience of it. And what you see is this transitioning of, of images of da different data centers, which are similar to the ones that we used in the book. And these are just some images from our initial deployment of the object. Um, and it was important for us. We were curious to see how it might fit into people's lives, where they might keep it in their homes. Um, and the object lends itself to a more personal individual experience. But at the same time, that also invites people to peer over other shoulders. And they were asking questions and wanted to know more about what, the, what was going on with the object. And that was really nice. Right. So there were several challenges that we encountered during the process. The first and the most important was how do you confront such a complex topic with a playful approach, something that we want to engage people in and want people talking about. Um, and the second was that the, we had to acknowledge the technological challenges and actually knowing how to find you where your data is and also think about new directions in which we can take this idea forward. Um, and the third was the fact that if people do have access to such a device, will it eventually change the relationship between people and the companies that they trust? And just where we want to take the project um, further in the future is it's important for us to give it to more people for longer periods of time um, to get a better sense of how it might fit into their lives. Would they use it? Um, what sort of reactions would it, would it spark and that sort of thing. Um, and finally, it's also important for us to take the object to more exhibits um, and public spaces to engage more people about these issues we've been thinking about. Um, and with that in mind, we hopefully will see you later at DemoFest. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, guys. All right, looks like Tom wants to dive in. Yeah, so um, I mean, I, the idea of this is really interesting to me, and it happens to coincide with my own, my, one of my own interests, so I'm, I'm glad to see it. Um, the design object itself, to mm. me, is um, feels incomplete. And it's because just picking it up to use it, I guess my question for you is, how do I know what I'm seeing without you standing next to me to explain it or the book there to explain it? What is there in the affordances of the design itself to tell me what's going on? Um, so within the, like the, the form of the device does not necessarily speak about what you see in it, but then, when, but then the idea is to, is to have this object in somewhere around your house where it actually provokes some curiosity to actually peep and look into it in, this, in a similar fashion where if you see any kind of toy and you immediately want to tinker around with it. And that was the intention of having such a form itself. And then when you look into it, and that's when you know that there is something, there's a connection to what you're actually, like your data itself. 
Yeah, I, I would just add to that that it, it isn't necessarily about providing clarity as to what particular data center you're looking at when you're looking through the object, but more to get you thinking about on a larger scale where your data is going and where are these places around the world as opposed to specific clarity with that data center. Sure, but I mean, I guess just thinking purely about the, the phenomenology of it, right? Mm -hmm. When I look into that, and it's a gorgeous object, I have to say, I could sit there play with it all day long. But I, without the previous explanation, I don't know that I'm looking at a data center, so I don't know that that's what it should provoke in my thoughts. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, the, this is, I've been thinking about this project f for two days now, because it, it's interesting, because it's different than, than the other ones we've seen. Mm. And it illustrates something else about where design fits in, because it's really provocative. Yeah. I don't get part of it, and that's its beauty. You've, you've left me thinking, and I'm trying to think, why are you doing that? And, and that notion that design doesn't have to be functional specifically, but rather to be a catalyst for um, thought. Yeah. And, and I, I just got to tell you that you succeeded uh, in, in that regard. And so the, you know, and so I could, the questions about how you represent the, the place is, is you've already addressed. This other thing is, is that, um, if there is time, but I, I don't do it, is this notion about what is the, what thoughts have you had about what you define place? Because when you say where is the data center, uh, in, in what calculus, right? The Cartesian, like it could be where is it on the map versus mm -hmm. where is it legally or where is mm -hmm. it ethically? Right. Um, and those are things with other notions. But again, it, you don't, maybe you don't even have to answer that question because it's your presentation forced me to think about that in a, in a way, right? And, and, and it's, it helps serve its purpose. But anyhow, it's, it's just, thank you. Thanks. So uh, building on that comment, this made me think about the kaleidoscope as a way of looking at the world differently. Um, and I was started to think, what would a kaleidoscope um, in which you were looking at, say, war look like? Or what would a kaleidoscope look like in which you were looking at love relations look like? You see, you see what I'm saying? Using the kaleidoscope as a way of thinking, thinking about um, relationships and, and data in a way that you know. And I think you could have a lot of fun with it, just playing with that tool as a way of, of thinking about all different data yeah. and meaning in our life. Um, very, very, as Bill said, very provocative um, in terms of thinking about data. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone else have any comments, questions? All right, thank you guys for the provoking. Thank you. Oh, and Toby, yes. <laughs> oh, there was one? Sorry. Yeah. yeah right Tom? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Check. All right. <laughs> and that was with Professor Toby Carrot. There he is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>